Today, we will continue our series in the book of Genesis. Last week, we looked at uh, chapter 1. This week, we're looking at chapter 2 and 3. So please go ahead and pull out a pen and paper and then open up your Bible or your favorite Bible app to Genesis chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin this morning, Genesis chapter 2. Now, it's been said that everything you need to know about life can be found in the lessons taught throughout the book of Genesis, just the first book alone. And I believe this series will put that premise to the test. But yet I have no question that Genesis will pass with flying colors. Amen. Now, last week we saw how God created the heavens and the earth and all that is within it. And we saw his response to everything he created was to say it was good. This week, we'll hear him say for the first time that something is not good. And we'll see something take place that is not good at all. And then we will learn what God plans to do about this bad thing. Now, today's story unfolds in three stages, or even three acts, if you want to say, and then God steps in. So let's see what happens in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Now, in the first phase of the story, this true story, we see life as it should be. Or you might say life as it was meant to be lived. What we see is God's original design for this earth. You see, Genesis chapter 1 is an overview of the creation story. Genesis chapter 2, it starts going into more detail. And more than that, it refers to God in more intimate terms. You know, interestingly enough, Genesis chapter 1, it uses the word Elohim to refer to God, who is the sovereign creator of everything. That's, that's what Elohim means, the sovereign creator of everything. Now, Genesis chapter 2, it uses the name Yahweh Elohim, and that's to refer to the Lord God. That is, he is also the covenant-making Yahweh found here in chapter 2 and elsewhere in the Old and New Testament. Furthermore, you know, it would be thousands or, you know, thousands of years later, so really into the second installment of Moses' five-part series, before the reader is fully able to, to understand the significance of the nature or, or the significance of the name of Yahweh. Of course, as you know, the name of God, the name that he's called, is a revelation of his character, of who he is. But again, that significance doesn't come until later. Even so, the writer introduces it here to us. And there's a reason for that. He introduces it here in Genesis chapter 2 to emphasize the personal nature of God's interaction with his creation. He's not some distant God who just got things going and spun the earth and let, you know, let it go, just let it spin until it's done. He is personally involved with his creation. Remember, what you hear me say all the time is, is it's not about religion. God did not create this world to create religion. It is about a personal relationship with God. And here in chapter 2, we see God already drawing that out for us, saying that I am a personal God. I am an intimate God. I, I am careful. I am still involved with you because you are part of my creation. Now, everything about Genesis chapter 2 shows us what life was meant to be. What it was meant to be. I mean, God placed the man, Adam, in a setting that can only be described as paradise, right? And he puts them to work. And God says, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. See, this is where we get our theology all messed up. Look what it says here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. He says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now, the Hebrew word used here for work is abad. Okay, it's abad. And it's translated here in verse 15 as to work. But it can also be translated as a word to serve. Now listen carefully. This was God's gift to Adam. 
Work was a gift. See, God gave him work in which he would be useful. That is, he would have a purpose. And his work would involve both service and supervision. And this is a good thing. It is good. This is God's plan from the beginning, before the fall of man, before sin. This was God's original plan. Work is a good thing. And the problem is there are some people who think, you know, based on the events that, that we know will take place later in this message, later in the book of Genesis, that work is a curse. However, work is not a curse. It is a blessing that was given to mankind before the fall. Because in work, we find purpose. In work, we define ourselves who we are, right? I mean, more properly, we should define ourselves in Christ first and foremost. But work gives us a sense of purpose. And God wanted everyone to have a sense of purpose. He wanted to know that you're not a mistake. That he has a plan for your life. And that you're special and unique. And no one can replace you. And that was his plan from the very beginning. You know, and this is also why in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12, King Solomon, who is probably the wisest person to walk this earth other than Jesus Christ, listen to what he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. He says this, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful, okay, and to do good as long as they live. Listen to verse 13. Also, that everyone should eat and drink, and ready for the next part, and take pleasure in all his toil. This is what? God's gift to man. Work is God's gift to man. It's a blessing. So here back in Genesis chapter 2, God puts Adam to work in the garden so that Adam can find satisfaction in his toil. That is the joy of a hard day's work. And God says, this is good. It's good. But then, for the first time, we see that God says something is not good. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, a lot of people get offended by this word helper. But you know what? Let me tell you something. The word helper does not mean subservient. It does not mean slave. Matter of fact, when you do a look in the Hebrew, it is the word ezer. Ezer, and it is the exact same word, ready for this, used to describe the help that God gives us. So this is clearly not about being subservient or being a slave. Okay, it's about being a helper. Because women, you know, men, we need all the help we can get, right? <laughs> so, now, I want you to notice that after God makes this statement, notice this, his next step is not to create Eve. Okay, you think, okay, it's not good for man to be alone, he needs a helper, boom, here's his helper, right? Not at all. Look what happens here. After saying it's not good, then the story continues really in a dramatic fashion in which God creates all the animals and gives Adam the task of naming each one. Matter of fact, listen to this passage, and if you're a father, okay, I think you're going to know what God the Father is doing here, and that is taking pleasure in seeing what Adam would call them. Okay, look what it says here in verse 19. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man, ready to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. You know, I can just picture this. You know, it's like, okay, Adam, here's your first animal. What are you going to name it? Um, duck bill platypus. Well, well, okay. <laughs> That's what you want to name it? You want to name it. But, you know, I think there were so many animals after a while, I think even Adam got tired, you know? Cat, dog. <laughs> you know, the names, I think, got shorter and shorter toward the end. 
But you know, I think each time though, step away, God's like, oh, that's a great name, Adam. It was a father taking pleasure in his first earthly child. You know, that, that's what I see when I read that, that verse. It was a loving father giving him a task. But you know what? This purpose was twofold. I mean, yes, we see a proud father was able to see his first earthly child in action. And second, and this is more important, in performing this task, well, maybe not more important, but it's just as important. In performing this task, Adam saw the traits of each beast and bird. And he also discovered for himself how each one had a complementary partner. In doing so, Adam then realized that he was alone. He realized that he had a need and that he realized that he needed a helper. He realized that he did not have a suitable partner for life. Nothing else in creation would be the helper that he needed. Not even the faithful dog. <laughs> you know, but once Adam made this discovery, uh, this discovery for himself, that is when God went into action. Look here at verses 20 and to 24. Okay, this is what he says. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper, not found a helper fit for them. Okay, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to man. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the man said, this at last, is, <coughs> at last is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. Think about that for a moment. It wasn't until after Adam discovered for himself that he needed a helper. After God allowed Adam to discover that for himself, and then he went into action. You know, it kind of reminds me of a lot of the way God does things, right? Salvation. Before you can get saved, what's the first thing you need to realize? Lost. That you're lost. That you have a need you have a need that you cannot fill you have a need that nothing else can fill but jesus christ and in the same way he let adam go through this discovery process and you know this is exactly how god intends it to be how it should be that a man and woman should be together as one having oneness and being together for life. You see, it's symbolic of our relationship with God, which is everlasting. That is without end. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. That is the most perfect marriage of all. And you want to know what? Divorce will never enter into this marriage between Jesus and us. Amen. Because he is the covenant keeper. It depends on him, not on us. And he is faithful. Amen. Now, Looking at the scripture, does this mean that, that no one will be single? No, it does not. Because you know what? We see elsewhere in scripture that there are a few who are called to a life of celibacy and solitude. Now, they will still have their relational needs met through the church, but that is a whole sermon for another day or a whole study for another day. But generally speaking, God's plan is that a man and a woman will be together as husband and wife and that is the ideal now there's another aspect of life as it was meant to be and that is that we can see here in the garden scene and that is that adam and eve lived in fellowship with god okay they lived in fellowship with god and Genesis chapter 3 refers to god taking a walk in the garden in the cool of the evening and i absolutely love this imagery you know i mean you get the impression that this was not uncommon. God was there a lot. He was there in the garden with Adam and Eve, and they had fellowship together. Now, do I know how that worked? No, I don't. <laughs> but you know what? 
I will discover that one day. Because one day I will see my Savior face to face and I will understand how that worked. But for now, we know it because God revealed it to us. I mean, it, this is what anyone would probably consider the perfect existence, right? Think about it. He had meaningful work, fulfilling relationships, and an ongoing, unlimited relationship with the God who created everything. Perfect, right? Now, I want you to notice, there was only one, only one stipulation to this perfect existence. Only one. Okay? God was not being overbearing here, was he? He had one stipulation. It's here in verses 16 and 17. It says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, all of them, every of them, Okay, all of them, but the tree, one tree, one stipulation, one tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. I mean, that's it. Think about it. Adam and Eve had free reign over all of creation, everything, with only one, only one stipulation. Stay away from this one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's it. And so the second chapter of Genesis, it closes with Adam and Eve basically living the dream, right? They are. I love how the writer sums it up. He says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. Now, now, this phrase is packed with symbolism, but we're going to sum it up this way. Adam and Eve were living life as it was meant to be lived. Living life as it was meant to be lived. That's what we discover in Genesis chapter 2. But you know what? <laughs> then comes the monkey wrench, right? This takes us to the next stage of the story. And that is, life takes an ugly turn. Okay? We see, I mean, and boy, was this an ugly turn. It really was. It is the beginning of chapter 3 that we meet a new character, the serpent, who is called the craftiest of all the creatures. By the way, when someone is called crafty, it is never meant to be taken as a compliment. Okay? So I pray no one here is ever called crafty. Okay? But, but listen... So what happens? See, the crafty serpent has a conversation with Eve, but the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, that Adam is right there with her, okay? And, and when, the, and when the, the serpent is talking to Eve, he uses plural verb forms in the Hebrew, okay? This is why sometimes it's good to go back to the original language. And, and the Hebrew, which in, indicates, because it's plural, that the serpent is talking to both of them. He's talking to Adam and Eve. It's just that Eve has taken a position in front of her husband. She has taken the role of leadership upon herself. So again, it's important to understand, this is not just Eve, it's both of them. So the serpent is talking about the one and only one rule that they've been given. One rule, stay away from the tree in the midst of the garden. Okay, one rule. By the way, the Bible does not mention the fruit specifically. Most of the time people draw an apple tree. But to me, my favorite illustration shows the fruit looking something like a hand grenade. I love this. This is probably the best illustration I've seen. Because you know what? That fruit ended up being very destructive fruit, didn't it? So I just, again, we don't know what fruit it was, what color it was, shape, size. All we know is it wasn't the right thing to eat. Okay, so anyway, we know from chapter 2, the serpent is referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So as the serpent is talking to Adam and Eve, we see in their conversation, it really is interesting, it's a point-by-point -point study in the science of temptation. And if we study it, I believe it's going to help us because it is still rings true today. Temptation really has not changed in the many thousands of years. It is the same as it ever was. And if you have ever given in to temptation, then I believe everyone here, including myself, has at one time or another, okay? 
I believe that you're going to recognize this process. But I think in identifying it, labeling it, I think it's going to help us better in the future as well. So please be sure to write this down because if you keep this process in mind, I truly believe it's going to help us next time that we're tempted. Okay, so the first thing the, tempt the serpent caused them to do in this tempting process was to question what God has said. He got them to question what God has said. Okay, so let's look here at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, right off the bat. Now the serpent was more crafty, okay, again, not a good crafty, bad crafty, was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? You hear that? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see what he's doing? He's kind of twisting it. He said, didn't God say you shall eat of any tree in the garden? And this is where temptation begins. You question what God has said. I mean, did God really say, I cannot do this? I mean, is this really so bad? I mean, is it such a terrible thing, you know, if I just tell a, a little white lie or, or yell at my kids or, or lie to my boss or cheat on my spouse or, you know, or occasionally go out and get hammered? I mean, I mean whatever your particular temptation is at the time might be. You see, the first step in temptation is to get you to say, is this really a rule? Because you know what? If it is, it really should not be one. It just doesn't make sense. And that, in effect, is what the serpent said to Adam and Eve. Okay, let's continue reading in verse, starting at verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Okay, so she acknowledges, yeah, God said we can eat of any of them. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay, so she was paying attention, right? She knew what God said. But the serpent's not done yet, is he? Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay, those aren't really the consequences. Okay, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, did you see that next trick that the devil had up his sleeve? <clears throat> okay, one, he will question what God has said, but then two, he flat out contradicts it. He contradicts it. He said, you will not surely die. So he questions what God says, and then he contradicts it. And this is what happens during temptation. You know, when you're being tempted, that lying voice will whisper in your ear, you know, nothing bad's going to come from this. It's okay. The, the so-called consequences, they're made up. You know, if they don't catch you, no one knows you did it, right? In fact, if you do this, you're going to make your life so much better. Think of it. You're going to be in charge. You're going to be calling your own shots. But those are lies straight from the pit of hell. <clears throat> I mean, I could spend a very long time, uh, you know, talking about many ways that we see Satan contradicting God within our cultural values today. That is contradicting what God has said here in his word. Because there's plenty of them. Trust me, there is. But I want to look at a couple this morning that might hit maybe a little too close to home. Let's look at ourselves first. Jesus commanded us, love your enemies. That's the command. No if, ands, or buts. Love your enemies. And sometimes we have a tendency to, to treat this commandment as if it is optional or it's non-existent. Especially around election time. I mean, sometimes we think it's okay to despise certain people because, you know, we are right and they're wrong. I mean, how could they ever think abortion is right? You know, they, we're good. They're bad. They're evil. Is that loving your enemies? Also, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus said that we should never speak to, speak to others with words of contempt. And yet, 
when an employee is late on a project, or maybe the waiter does not get an order right, or the kids don't do you know what they were supposed to do. For some people who might be otherwise quite <clears throat> quote religious or spiritual, it's like the rule never existed, and all hell breaks forth from their mouth. And this is what temptation does. It lures its victims into saying, you know what, God never said that. And if he did say that, he didn't mean it. He could have mean it. I mean, you know, I mean, it's wrong. How could he have meant that? You see, temptation wants you to question what God has said. And then second, he is going to contradict what God said. And, and then when you're at your most vulnerable, okay, temptation wants you to think about it often as much as possible before you rule it out okay stick with me as we step through this temptation wants you to think about it as long as you can before you rule it out okay look what it says here in genesis chapter 3 verse 6 okay so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was the delight to the eyes and that the, the tree was to be desired to make one wise so she was thinking about it, wasn't she? She was considering all these things. But wait a second, okay? Then what happened? She took up its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. She thought about it, right? Wow, it's good for food. Hey, it's pleasing to the eye, you know? And it's desirable for gaining wisdom. I mean, these are all excellent things, are they not? Aren't they? After all, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? That's the problem. Temptation, especially the one be, who is behind temptation, is like that certain kind of salesman who's offering you a product that you really do not need and probably, probably cannot really afford. You know, that salesman, he does not want you to think about the payments. He does not want you to think about the strain it could put on you financially. He wants you just to think about all the theoretical benefits that his product can offer you. You know, prestige, comfort, style, security. Because you know what? The devil knows that if he can just get you to think about it, if you will just consider it long enough, you'll probably get around to doing it. You see, this is exactly why Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is saying that thinking something bad is just as destructive as doing something bad. Why? Because thinking eventually leads to to doing it it's like Jesus was saying if you think about doing something wrong all the time it's as good as done it's just like what the writer and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson once said we become what we think about all day long so we see this temptation process is here at work in Adam and Eve and it's still here today so we have to be on our toes one questioning God, two, contradicting God, three, think about all the reasons why they should disobey. Justifying your wrong choices. And it says that after Eve gave the matter some thought, she took some of his fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That's the temptation process. So what happened next? Well, the answer is for us here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says this, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You see, the result of the breach the result of breaking this one and only one rule. The result was not wisdom 
as Satan promised, was it? The result was shame. It only brought shame. Now at this point, you'll notice the serpent has nothing more to say to Adam and Eve. He considers his work done. He tempted them. They allowed themselves to be tempted and they sinned. He's done. He, success. Meanwhile, Adam and Eve, they now feel the need to cover themselves. And then when God comes to walk in the garden in the cool of the evening, I love that phrase, they feel the need to hide. Again, shame. Indeed, life has taken a very ugly turn from the paradise we read about in Genesis chapter 1. A very ugly turn. <laughs> and just, just when you think it cannot get any worse, we enter the third act. Now comes the dreaded aftermath. Okay? Now comes the dreaded aftermath. Now, if you look in your Bible, starting at verse 8, we see that when God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, he calls to Adam, where are you? Now, you know God knew, right? Yeah. But again, God is in the discovery process. He wants us to figure things out for ourselves. And something else we have to do before we can receive forgiveness, what else do we have to do? Confess our sin. So he's leading him through this discovery process. So he says, Adam, where are you? <laughs> Adam says, I was naked and ashamed, so I hid from you. And then God says, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? Again, rhetorical question. He says, have you been eating of the tree I command you not to eat? Now, are you ready for this? Because Adam's response has been used countless times throughout history. It's still being used today. Listen to this response in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. The man said, Adam said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Did you hear what Adam was saying? Adam was saying it was part Eve's fault, but he also was saying it was part God's fault. Because God was the one who brought Eve into the picture. I mean, okay, so yeah, I need to be completed, and I didn't have anyone to help me, and you brought me a helper, but still, you brought her in. Now, in that scenario, did you notice who had no blame at all? Adam. Okay? We're not done yet. <laughs> Look at what comes next in verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And again, Eve's response has been used countless times throughout history. The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Do you realize she was, it wasn't Flip Wilson, but it was Eve who was the first in history to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah. Flip Wilson became a little more famous for that saying. But Eve was the first person to say, the devil made me do it. Now, in the Eve statement, again, did you notice who had no blame at all? Eve. You see, this is the first part of the aftermath of the fall. What we like to call the blame game. See, we have a tendency to, blame, to place blame on whoever and, and whenever we can. You know, we have become masters of saying, you know what, it's not my fault. In fact, the more I think about it, it's your fault. It's your fault. You know, it's not my fault. You know, I was born this way. How many times have you heard that? Or, it's not my fault. You know, it's my parents' fault that I am the way I am. I mean, that's what popular psychology teaches. You're the way you are today because of your parents. 
You see, we live in a blame addicted world. And we all fall prey to the blame game, myself included. God, however, did you notice this? He did not accept either of their excuses. Uh uh. You know, he dealt with the servant, the serpent, excuse me, he dealt with the serpent, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But you know what? He also dealt specifically with Adam and Eve. And he said, in effect, there will be some fallout because of what you have done. There will be consequences because of what you have done. So let's continue reading here in verse 16. What else happened? He says this, To the woman he said to Eve, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Now, women, originally there was pain in childbearing. It just wasn't as bad. Okay? It says, I will multiply your pain. He didn't say, I'm going to give you pain. Okay, so let's correct that theology because some people go around teaching before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no pain in childbirth. That's not what it says. It says here plainly, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Okay? That's part of the consequence. Second one, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Okay, but he shall rule over you. You know what he's saying there? He says, you will find yourself in a constant power struggle with your husband. But God says plainly, but he will rule over you. Again, you're not to be a doormat. You're not to be a slave. You're a helper. You're equals. The man is not higher than the woman. The woman not higher than the man. But because of this reason, God placed the man to be over the woman. It's not a bad thing. Okay? We need to understand that. But again, he never called anyone to be a doormat or to be a slave or to be beaten or to be abused. No, that is not good. Please remember that. He goes on to say this. And he goes on to talk now to the man. He talks to Adam, starting in verse 17. He says, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, that is, because you did not take the lead like you should have. See, God was saying, Adam, when serpent was, te- was tempting your wife and talking to her, you should have just stepped in between them and said, Satan, serpent, get away from us. I don't want to hear what you have to say. That's what Adam should have done. He should have taken the role of husband, the role of protector, and stepped in between and said, "Uh uh-uh, we're not going there today. That's what God's saying to Adam here. That's what Adam should have done. Okay? He should have stepped up and be the man. (laughs) Because that's what a man does. He loves his wife, and he protects her. And like Jesus, if he has to, he gives his life for her. That's what the Bible says. So he says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. Again, it's not a suggestion. It was a command. Which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. He even repeats the command. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But guess what? (laughs) God's not done yet. Okay, verse 18. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now I'm about to throw a little bit of theology at you. But these punishments, or these chastisements, represent what's called retaliatory justice. That is, their wrong actions determined the consequences. Okay, their wrong actions determined the consequences. Adam and Eve sinned by eating. Therefore, they would suffer in order to eat. You see how one is defined by the other? Eve manipulated her husband, so she would now be mastered by her husband. Okay, the serpent, the serpent, excuse me, the serpent destroyed the human race. 
Therefore, he will be destroyed. You see how they all tie together? And to think, all this because mankind wanted to become like God. Well, so much for ambitions for divinity, right? And there's also an important lesson to be learned here. Mankind may attempt to be like God, but then God reminds us, we are just dust. That's a hard lesson. We're dust, but he loves us, and we'll see that in a minute. Now, as a quick side note to parents and grandparents, when a child does wrong, we need to follow God's, Father God's example and ensure that the consequences are determined by their wrong actions, yeah. meaning there are levels to consequences. Okay? The answer to everything is not to beat, your, beat the living daylights out of your child for everything. Please make sure the consequences match the wrongdoing. That's the way God the Father did it. That's the way we need to do it. But we're still not done yet, are we? Look what happens next. And then God invited Adam and Eve to vacate the premises. He gave them their eviction notice. Look here at verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Now you notice something there. He was still giving Adam purpose. Okay? He was still giving Adam purpose. Then he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And, and you do know, cherubim are not those cute little angels with diapers that shoot arrows, right? Cherubim are the mighty warrior angels. You do not want to mess with them. Okay, they're, 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 trust me, they're the Marines of the angels. Okay, you don't, you don't cross one. And by the way, did you know that verse 24 was an act of mercy? You see, God in his love did not want mankind to live forever and be forever separated from him. Therefore, he kept mankind from eating from the tree of life. Okay, notice it wasn't the tree of knowledge. It was the tree of life. And he guarded it with the warrior angel. So this we see is the fallout from man. This is the dreaded aftermath. See, Adam and Eve would go on to raise their family. Their first sons were named Cain and Abel. You know how that turned out, right? But yet their family life would often be characterized by chaos. And the chaos would continue from generation to generation to generation. And life would become more and more of a mess all until the day when God called upon a man named Noah. But I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> That's not today's message. So, what about the serpent? What happened there? Well, I'm glad you're paying attention. See, God told him that he would spend the rest of his days crawling on his belly and eating dust. Which, that's what the snake does today, right? Mm -hmm. Then he said something that makes all the difference in the world. Because it was a prophecy, a foreshadowing of what was coming. Here we see the first promise of the Messiah, yeah. of the Deliverer, of Jesus Christ in that role. Look what it says here. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and, and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now again, in the Hebrew grammar, it clearly it's clear that the noun here, offspring, is singular, not plural. That refers to one individual. Okay? So God says to the serpent, in effect, in effect, he says, you will bite or bruise him on the heel, but only while he is using his heel to crush you into the ground. Which I'm sure most of you want to do when you see a snake, right? Now, I don't know if you all ever saw The Passion of the Christ, but you might remember this one scene. At the beginning, Jesus is praying at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Satan is there to provoke him. Okay? And, and, and Jesus rejects all the tempter says. You see, 
Jesus saw the cycle. He saw the temptation cycle, but you know what? He beat it how? With truth, with scripture. Okay? He says, God surely did not say, and he says, well, yes, he did say. He said, boom, 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 boom. And he said, that's it. He didn't even give him a chance, so Satan had to go tempt him with something else. You see, Jesus rejects all the tempter says, and then he stands to leave. In the movie, the tempter is transformed into a snake, and Jesus stops on his head with the heel of his foot. You see, that's what God was talking about in Genesis chapter 3. He was talking about the crucifixion or the death of Jesus Christ. I mean, it was a minor victory for Satan. Basically, he bit Jesus on the heel. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, I'm sure Satan was down in hell with all of his demons, and they were having a party like, yeah, woo, we won. But then came a crashing blow. Something that interrupted their little party. It happened three days later. Jesus rose from the grave because death could not hold him in its power. Amen. And Satan, he was crushed. Matter of fact, you could say that since the days of Eden, Satan has been a defeated foe. The victory is ultimately ours through Jesus Christ. Now, speaking through the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit tells us something in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Okay? Here he's talking about Adam. But he's also talking about us, because all sinned. And he says a few verses later, in verses 18 and 19, he says, Therefore, as one trespass leads to condemnation for all men, okay, one sin. You commit one sin, you're condemned. He says, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Okay? For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Of course, referring to Adam. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Of course, referring to Jesus, sometimes referred as the second Adam. You see, this is the promise of God for people everywhere. Today, we are living in the aftermath of the choice that Adam and Eve made. But let's not all lay all the blame on them. Okay, we're not going to play the blame game. Why? Because there's a sense in which their story is our story. We have all made the same choice. We have all chosen with intention to disobey God. Why? Because we are all sinners, myself included. God's word says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Death and sin entered the world through Adam, and today we live in the dreaded aftermath in a world that is not as it should be. And, and it seems like we are, we are chained to sin in a way that God never, ever intended for his creation to be. He never intended us to live this way. So this begs the question, what can you do about it? You begin by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay the price for your sins. And then he rose from the grave, crushing the serpent's head, <laughs> And crushing the serpent's hold on your life. Putting an end to whatever claim your old life may have had on you. Sure, the serpent still comes around from time to time. Trying to question, contradict, and coax you into considering a life of disobedience. But the serpent does not look like he used to, does he? There's a reminder for us. He slithers now, doesn't he? And his head, is his head not flat? As if it has been stomped by the heel of Christ? That's to remind us he is a defeated foe. Amen. You do not have to be his victim. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, For it because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive, okay, receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. You see, through his death on the cross, Jesus has provided the free gift of salvation. And this is God's answer to the dreaded aftermath. Life in Jesus Christ, 
This is what his love has given us. Yeah, we have the consequences of the dreaded aftermath, but his response was one of love. So my final question today is this. Do you have life in Jesus Christ? You know, that is, are you 100% sure that you have not religion, but a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Are you 100% sure that if you died today, that you would go to heaven? If not, you can be 100% certain that you're in a relationship with God by accepting Jesus' free gift of salvation. How? I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us clearly in Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 8. Sometimes we forget verse 8, but it's important. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Faith. That is what you and I, what we believe about Jesus Christ. We believe that he came to save us from ourselves. We believe that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is Lord, that salvation is a free gift that he offers. And there's nothing you and I could ever do to earn it. We can't, we can't work for it no matter what. But there is one thing we can do. That is receive it. Receive that free gift of salvation. Well, how do we receive it? Well, keep on reading. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It's pretty clear and simple. This is not, by the way, a magic formula. This is not a magic prayer. It's not some magic words. It's not an incantation. You say, and boom, you're saved. Because while you're confessing with your mouth your faith in Jesus Christ, you have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Amen. Two stipulations for this one. We messed up with the one stipulation rule, didn't we? So this time God gave us two stipulations. We confess with your mouth our faith in Jesus Christ, and we have to believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And if you're ready to do that, I'll give you an opportunity to do that in a moment. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we just come before your throne, humbled, humbled by your, your, your outrageous love for us. Your, your never-ending love. Your love knows no boundaries. Lord, even when we deserve much worse, you still made a way because you are a personal, loving God. You've made a way for us to be reconciled to you. And that is through your son, Jesus Christ. All we have to do is, is understand that, Lord, yes, we are sinners. Yes, I make bad choices, really bad choices. I make wrong choices. Lord, I don't do the things I should do. I do things I shouldn't. Lord, I disagree with your word. And Lord, there's consequences to that. The consequence is separation from our Heavenly Father. And also an eternity condemned to a place called hell. But Lord, you love us so, wet, so much you gave us a free ticket out. But Lord, all we have to do is believe in you. And it's more than just a free ticket. It's an invitation to a relationship. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, whether you're here live or listening later by the internet, this morning, hopefully God is speaking to you, to your heart. Perhaps this morning you say, you know what? I don't know if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know. That, you know, I, I know I have religion. I know I attend church faithfully. You know, I, I know I read the Bible. I know I pray. But I'm not so sure about that relationship thing. Then today you can be sure. Because like we just read, Jesus has provided the means. And again, there's no magic words, but you need to confess with your mouth your faith in Jesus Christ. You also need to believe it in your heart. You need to confess that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself. Confess that Jesus Christ, you know that Jesus Christ died specifically for you. That he paid a price for your sin that you could never pay. 
but today that you are willing to receive his free gift of salvation. You're ready to receive his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, even though you and I deserve much, much worse. And after doing that, thank him. Say, Lord, thank you for that free gift of salvation. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming into my life forever. And according to God's word, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And again, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship, a personal, intimate relationship with, with the creator of the universe. With heads bowed, eyes still closed. If today you've made that prayer, I want you to know that God loves you and is so thrilled. It says, the Bible says that right now angels are rejoicing all over heaven because of your decision. But watch out, the serpent's right around the corner. He's coming at you with temptation. He's going to get you to question things. He's going to contradict. And he's going to make you think about it for a while. Your only protection is God's word. So I want to encourage you, spend every day, spend some time every day, first thing, in God's word. Read it. Hear what God says. Know what God says. So when Satan tries to tell you a lie, you can say, uh-uh, that's not what I read in his word. That's not what God said to me. You're lying to me, and I reject that. You will not contradict what God says in my life. I will stand firm on God's word. Because that's what we do. That's how we defend ourselves. That's how Jesus showed us how he did it, and that's his example we follow. So get in God's word. Spend time in the daily. Talk to God. Develop your relationship. And then please make the effort to try to, to, to come together in the church services or Bible studies with other believers. Because we were never designed to be lone wolves. Even if you're called to be celibate, even if you're not called into marriage, you're still called into relationship, one with God and two with other believers. How can we love one another if we're not in each other's presence? And again, I know there's ways that we provide safe ways of doing that, even in the pandemic. And Lord, for the rest of us here today, I pray that we realize we see things a little bit differently, Lord, how much we're affected. And Lord, I hope that we're better prepared when someone asks us or says, you know what, it's not fair. I had someone this week say, you know what, it's not fair that we all have to pay the price for Adam and Eve. But now maybe now we can answer them and say, you know what, but we don't. We pay the price for our sins. We're not going to play that blame game anymore. Lord, I pray that each of us in here today, that we will all stop playing the blame game. And Lord, we'll start taking ownership for what we do. And Lord, realize even when we have medical issues, just like my mom used to say, I have a medical problem. I don't have an excuse. So Lord, help us, help us in our weaknesses. Strengthen us. Let us not give in temptation. Lord, let us not play the blame game. And let us truly love one another. For all these things we lift up in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord and Savior. Amen. So again, thank you for joining us today. And again, thank you for those who are joining us on the internet as well, whether you join us on Facebook or YouTube. I do want to encourage you um, to, 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 if God's spoken to you today, and I hope you took notes, review those notes, think about those notes, especially because you know what? When we head out those doors, temptation's right on the other side. And we have to be careful. So thank you for joining us today. And as you leave here today, remember the dreaded aftermath of not only Adam and Eve's sin, but our own sin. And then consider God's answer to the aftermath. And that is life in Jesus Christ. To walk in the Spirit. And please remember that as you leave here today. So, Brother Mike, would you please come forward? and lead us in our closing prayer, please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to hear this wonderful message that we've heard today, Lord. And may we put it in our daily walk and life to show others the way to you. And Lord, those that are listening through the internet, if anyone don't know you, 
that we ask today to come to you and accept you as Lord and Savior. And we ask this in the name of my most precious Jesus. Amen.